Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the next installment in our Life Sciences webinar series. My name is Jeff Beagler, and today Chad Shear and I will discuss strategies for positioning your company for success against generic challenges. Uh, in the control panel on your, your dashboard, we have our biographies uh, and slides that are available for download. You'll also find there a New York, New Jersey blank CLE form. At some point during the presentation, we'll be reading the, the New York, New Jersey CLE code, so you can fill that in on the form. Uh, please note you must be logged into the webinar uh, on your device in order to receive CLE credit. You won't receive credit for listening to the, the audio portion only. So Chad and I are gonna, gonna talk for about an hour today. Um, you can ask questions at, at any time in the, the Q&A area of the control panel. And we're, we're going to do our best to answer them as we go, um, time permitting, of course. If we don't get to your question, we'll follow up with you after the webinar. And, of course, please, please feel free to um, just contact us directly with questions afterwards. Uh, so before we get started, uh, because we are a law firm, um, I have to read a, a quick legal disclaimer, of course. Uh, and that is that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only uh, and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court or case situation. So that said, I think we're going to provide you with some great information today uh, as we talk through ways to position your company for success against generic challenges. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the basic idea of the presentation today is to talk about things that uh, relevant stakeholders, whether it's in-house practitioners or, or outside counsel advising them, can do during the, the drug development and regulatory process to give the company the best chance to succeed against generic challenges. We know today for any successful drug, generic challenges are basically inevitable. Uh, and these days, not only are you gonna get probably one or two antifilers, but you might get a whole, a whole group of, of generic challengers. There's lots of advice out there about things you can do uh, pre-suit, shortly before and as get filed, um, or, or before you file your complaint uh, to get ready for Hatch-Waxman litigation. But we wanted to look today at things you, you can and should be thinking about earlier in the process um, during drug development, because by the time you get to that sort of immediate pre-suit, um, a lot of things are, are going to have happened um, that you, you have to live with. You can't go back and, and change. Um, and thinking about those things early can put you in the best position uh, when you get to that, that Hatch-Waxman litigation. So we thought we'd start by um, looking at a, a basic timeline for drug development, which you see um, on the slide. Um, this, this is, of course, highly generalized, um, and the exact timing of drug development is, is going to vary and it could vary greatly depending on the, the exact drug and situation. But for, for most, if not all drugs, um, typically you have a period of, of drug discovery where you're trying to identify um, clinical candidates to move forward. You perform preclinical testing um, on the candidates you identify, uh, which culminates in the filing of, a, of an IND um, for approval by the FDA. Um, once you have an approved IND, you can move into to clinical trials. Um, for most drugs, that uh, includes phases one through three before you submit an NDA. And that, that piece alone, um, on average, can, can take six to seven years. Um, once you have your clinical results, you can submit an uh, NDA to the FDA. It'll go through a review process there and hopefully ultimately get um, approved so you can market and sell um, the, the drug product. So the point here is that 
this process um, by any standard is very long. We, we've shown an 18 year time period here um, and it may be longer or shorter than that, but a lot of things are going to happen during this relatively long period of time that are gonna ultimately affect um, your chances of success in Hatch-Waxman litigation. So, so what is the, the timing of Hatch-Waxman litigation relative to all this work that scientists um, and other folks in the company are doing during drug development? Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Let's talk just a little bit about um, the, the provisions of the Hatch-Waxman Act. Uh, so that the Hatch-Waxman Hatch Act was, was passed in, in 1984, and it's, it's widely been called a, a compromise that balanced the interests of, of pioneer pharmaceutical companies on one hand um, and the generic drug industry on the other hand. And, and one of the important um, things provided by the Hatch-Waxman Act um, are, are various types of regulatory exclusivities, um, which you can see there in the, the first four bullets of, of this slide. So these are time periods during which FDA will not approve a generic application. Um, it's one way that the Hatch-Waxman scheme rewards pioneers for, for all of their investment and effort put into getting new drugs approved. Uh, the most important ones for purposes of our discussion today are um, new chemical entity or NCE exclusivity um, and marketing exclusivity. So with NCE exclusivity, um, that generally applies to the first approval of, a, of an active ingredient in a drug product. If you have that type of exclusivity, FDA cannot finally approve a generic application uh, for a period of five years. For marketing exclusivity, um, that applies when a branded drug company conducts new clinical studies um, that lead to approval. Um, it may be for a new indication for a, a already approved drug, a new patient population, um, a new formulation, um, things of that nature. For marketing exclusivity, um, the FDA can't finally approve a generic application for a period of, of three years. So, so just because the FDA can't approve, um, uh, finally approve uh, generic applications, it, it doesn't mean that those applications can't be filed. So um, for, for drugs with marketing exclusivity, even though the, the generic applications, the ANDAs, cannot be approved for three years, they can be filed at any time after the, the NDA is approved. Um, so it could be the day after your NDA is approved and, and you launch your drug product, you could start getting ANDAs and, and we've seen it happen very quickly, uh, maybe not one day, but, but very quickly after NDA approval um, for those with marketing exclusivity. For NCE exclusivity, the rule's a little different. Um, the generic companies have to wait four years to file an ANDA um, if they include a paragraph four certification. So if they certify that they um, believe their product won't infringe patents in the orange book or that those patents are invalid or unenforceable, um, they can file four years before, uh, or excuse me, four years after the NDA is approved. Um, if there is no paragraph four certification, they have to wait the full five years. So, so what happens um, after an AND is filed? Um, the Hatch-Waxman Act makes the filing of an AND uh, an artificial act of infringement that allows the, the NDA holder to sue after it gets the, the paragraph four notice uh, that the AND has been filed. If they do sue, uh, within 45 days of receiving the notice, FDA can't finally approve the ANDA for 30 months. So there's this 30 month stay of FDA approval that kicks in um, after the filing of a lawsuit. Generally, that's 
um, the time for that is based off of the filing of the, the lawsuit. Um, for drugs with NCE exclusivity, however, um, it's a little different. You actually get 30 months from the, the five-year exclusivity date, um, so essentially seven and a half years um, after the NDA has been approved, the 30-month stay will expire. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So going back to our timeline, um, we've overlaid the timing of um, Hatch-Waxman litigation with the drug development process so we can see how those two relate to each other. The scenario we have here assumes that um, the drug has NCE exclusivity, um, and as you can see on the timeline, the ANDA is filed about four years after um, the, the NDA is approved by FDA. Um, after the lawsuit's filed, we get into Hatch-Waxman litigation, um, which usually has a period of fact discovery, expert discovery, um, and, then, and then eventually trial. And what, what we can take away from this is that the trial in your Hatch-Waxman case might happen as, as many as 25 years after um, the work starts that leads to a, an approved branded drug. Um, and it takes a lot of advanced planning to figure out what you can be doing during that drug development period um, to positively impact something that's going to happen, um, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years later. So we thought we, thought we would um, sort of start at the end in, in thinking through what sort of things can be done during drug development to, to help get a good result um, and look at what a Hatch-Waxman trial looks like and then what... Um, what folks can do um, to, to help get a good result when we get to that trial. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and, and turn it over to Chad for the next slide, um, who's gonna start talking through uh, what a Hatch-Waxman trial looks like. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and, and let me just start by saying, my name's Chad Shears, as Jeff pointed out at the beginning. Um, and let me say, thank you for giving us your time um, especially during, with all that's going on, thank you for, for dialing into this. And thank you to, the, to those that have come back um, who have been here for some of the previous webinars. Uh, it's, at least, it's at least a little encouraging that we haven't completely scared you off yet. Um, if you look at the slide, there are obviously all types of different kinds of patents that can come into play in, in a pharmaceutical invention, and they run the gamut. Um, most people begin thinking only of those that can be listed in the orange book and and, and with good reason um, because naturally you want to have a patent listed in the orange book so that you can get your 30 month stay so that you have time to uh, litigate your case without the fear of of a, of a generic entrant into the market um, but those aren't the only patents that that you can that you can actually assert in a hatch waxman case so the orange book listed patents, compound patents, formulation patents, methods of treatment, polymorph patents, those are all the kinds that are statutorily allowed to be listed in the orange book. And in fact, those are the kinds that you are statutorily obligated to list in the orange book. Um, but you can also have patents on the process. You can have patents on metabolites. You can have patents on, de on devices. Um, and in fact, we're getting to a place where devices can be listed in the orange book. Uh, in some circumstances. Um, so all of those come into play. You may need to plead them slightly differently, um, but regardless, those, the, you should be, when facing this challenge or when thinking about facing this challenge, you should be looking at your entire portfolio, not just the patents that are in the orange book. So if we go to the next slide, um, what we've tried to do here is, is lay out sort of typically speaking, when these kinds of patents, what 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 time during the development cycle that these various kinds of patents generally correspond to? This isn't you know written in stone, but if 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 you're in charge of of putting this portfolio together and and you haven't done it before, um, generally speaking, your your compound patents will be filed first. 
probably in year zero or year one, it's going to be a genus patent that is to a broad class of compounds that your R&D department has told you is showing some signs of activity. A um, couple years later, maybe even a year later, whenever it happens, you, you may file a species case to the specific compound that's showing, um, that's showing good signs of, of activity. And then as you enter uh, the preclinical testing phase, you might start to see indications on usage. You might start to see um, uh, the, the treatment plans that can work. You might start to see formulations that need to be used. Um, just to, to, to briefly tell you a story, we had a case where, um, if you can imagine this, this timeline, instead of going from zero to 25 years to trial, went from zero to 40 years to trial. And the reason that it did was that they found this compound, it had unbelievably cool activity. Um, it was an anti-angina medication that, that had no impact on heart rate or blood pressure, which, which made it truly unique because all the prior indications, all the prior medicines had had some negative effect either on blood pressure or heart medication. And when you're talking about an elderly population, a compound that could treat chronic angina but not have one of those negative side effects is pretty huge. But they couldn't figure out how to make it work. They had this great uh, in vitro activity. They filed the compound patent. They filed a genus compound patent. Then they filed a species compound patent. And by the time they actually had product approval, both of those patents had expired because they had to do 63 clinical trials. And the reason it took so many clinical trials was they couldn't figure out a formulation that would work or a dosage that would work. And then ultimately they did, but it was, like I said, 63 clinical trials later. So by the time we got to trial, we were just asserting method of treatment and formulation patents. Um, so, so this timeline is typical, but it can spread out and, and, and you have to have some flexibility. The, the main point of the timeline here and the main, the, the main um, the main reason we have it is just to have you thinking about the types of patents you can pursue generally and the types of patents when you can pursue those patents. They, they, um, it's, it's, it just gives you some reminders about, okay, my team's entering phase one. I should be thinking about method of treatment patents. Those become valuable. Getting towards phase two, phase three, maybe it's a process patent. So all things to to be considered along the path um, and, and all are incredibly valuable down the road. It isn't just the compound patents that matter. Some, some people are of that view, that's, that's not true. We at this point in the last decade have done over a hundred Hatch-Waxman cases. And I can tell you that in, I think it's 94 of those hundred cases, we haven't had a compound patent in play. The compound patent had expired and we were only asserting method of treatment or formulation patents. Um, so those those things are of, of, of real value. So if we can go to the next slide, one of the things that one of the goals we're, we're trying to get across today, and you all will be the judge about whether or not we were successful at it, is to sort of help everyone jump back and forth from year zero when you're following a compound patent to year 25 when you're doing a trial. Because as you as you start doing more and more of these trials, what what I think most people start to see, certainly what we've seen, is that patterns start to emerge about what is a sort of a winning approach to trial. And if you're on the branded side, the winning approach is before we get to the approach, maybe just a, a quick word on your audience. So remember, these are bench trials. More often than not, you are trying the case in front of a judge who went to law school for a really good reason. They didn't want to be a scientist. Um, and you may be in front of a judge who is uh, technologically phobic or, or uh, hasn't done a patent case before. Um, obviously, if you're in Delaware or New Jersey, that's not going to be your situation, but, but um, it isn't always the case that you can file these cases in Delaware or New Jersey. So, so understand that while the judge might not be the most technically savvy person in the world, what the judge will be really, really, really good at is sniffing out 
um, sniffing out, let's just say stories that are less than uh, less than accurate. I think there's a, a a more euphemistic word I am trying to avoid using, but regardless, that's sort of that's sort of where we are. The the um, so what's really important to the judges because they may not completely understand the science, and in their defense, there not may not be enough time for them to completely understand the science. If you're talking about doing a Hatch Waxman trial in five days. It's not very much time to actually try to to um, to to really fully educate the court on all the minutia of the details of the technology. So what the court is going to be looking for are things the court can easily grasp. Invention story is really important. Um, the the invention story often will and to the best of your ability should center on not just your successes, but also your failures. How did you get to the ultimate invention? And why is it important? Um, leads to clinical benefits. So the court will want uh, an understanding of why this drug is important. What was the problem it was solving? Why is it better than the prior standard of care? And ultimately, what is the commercial impact? How did it do? Um, was it well received by the marketplace? The important thing to remember, and it's a it's a it's a piece that frankly most lawyers miss. Um, the lawyers don't get to tell the judge the story. The lawyers get to sort of act as the directors to help the fact witnesses actually educate the court on the story. So you have to think about how you're going to do that. Um, a lot of these trials set up as your first witness will come in, the witness will will educate the court on, okay, this is the disease, this is the number of people that suffer from it, this is why it's so devastating, this is what the prior standard of care was, and this is our product. That's sort of witness number one. Witness number two, usually an inventor comes in, or multiple inventors come in, and they explain how it is that they that they achieved the invention. Why was the invention important? Why was it hard to develop? And then you usually end with a commercial witness that explains the commercial impact. But these trials all tend to lay out the same way. Now, what's really, really hard is that your first witness, this sort of face of the company witness, if you will, that witness is going to be testifying with the most recent information. So if we go to the next slide. So what we put across the bottom of the timeline here is Generally speaking, when the when sort of the evidence that gets developed for trial, sort of when that actually is taking place in your development timeline. So your your clinician or your your face of the company who's going to come in and explain why this is clinically important probably gets to talk about really recent stuff. Easy documents to find, easy story pieces to to, to talk through. The commercial witness has it even easier. They're just pulling numbers from last month. Um, that's that's really simple. The inventors have it the hardest because the inventors, you can see, you're talking about a trial at year 25. You might have inventors talking about things that happened 15, 20, 25 years ago. And memories fade, no matter no matter who you're who you're dealing with. Um, I cannot tell you the number of times that I've sat down with an inventor for the very first time, I've showed the inventor his or her patent, and he or she has said to me, I don't, I didn't invent this. I have no memory of this. And then you have to start going through the records to show them, yeah, yeah, no, you actually did this work. This was like really cool groundbreaking work. This is, this is a big deal. Um, now, of course, Critically, <laughs> you have to be able to know that you can you can find those documents, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later about how to deal with deal with inventors. But but importantly, just to finish up on the trial theme before we move move a little further from it, in every Hatch Waxman case, there are like five groups of documents that are critical. Obviously, you need the patent. 
obviously you need the prosecution history. Everybody knows those two. Um, you also need the lab notebooks. Those are also important because especially if you have to try to try to sync up the examples that are in the patent versus actual work that you did. Sometimes you need to prove that up. The other two groups of documents though are, are documents that tend to be more difficult to find. One is team meeting minutes if they exist. And the second one is, is reports up to management on what the team has done. The reason that those two groups of documents are really important is those two groups of documents tend to be the documents that substantiate your invention, but do it in normal person speak. Um, if, it, if, if we're talking about an organic, if we're talking about a small molecule, the lab notebooks are going to be a bunch of organic chemistry drawings that a typical judge probably doesn't understand what they mean. Um, whereas the team meeting minutes will refer to the code number or the code name or whatever the name for the compound is then and report in really basic terms, you know, what's happening with the development. But even better are the PowerPoints or the presentations or the memos that go up to senior management where the scientists are talking to the business people because those, those are contemporaneous documents back from when the invention was done where the scientists have made an effort to, to try to communicate um, to, to someone who's not a scientist. Granted, someone who still has a better understanding of the science than, than your judge might, but nevertheless, not a, not a PhD organic chemist. So those are, those are important to find. Now, why is the invention story so important? It's not just, it, it, it is that the judge gets it, but it also impacts the ultimate determination, believe it or not, even though for, for all of the folks on the phone who are patent, patent people, you know, no, nowhere in nowhere in in the statute or in the PTO regs does it say anything about invention story. But if you pull a case law, the case law does. So if we can go to the next slide. So so we just pulled two cases, and there are stacks of these um, where you see things that say where judges say things like this. And I'm just going to read the first the first two sentences from the first one. Finally. The process engaged by the inventors demonstrates the highly unpredictable nature of the prodrug development approach. The inventors prepared 20 prodrug candidates and evaluated their conversion rates and absorption rates. Pfizer submitted evidence that their experiments yielded unpredictable results. Okay, right there, the judge is using the inventor's own work to try to get a feel for how easy it is to work in this field. And in, the, in that situation, the inventor's own work showed that the field was unpredictable and, and, and ultimately difficult. Um, the next one, and these are both out of Delaware, very savvy, savvy judges. Next one, the judge says, I find even stronger support for the non-obviousness of claim 16 of the 456 patent in the struggles of the inventors to arrive at uh, uh, rivaroxaban. The plaintiffs described the fortuitous path the inventors took to arrive at rivaroxaban. So, so just think about that. The judge is using the inventor's work to help the judge reach a conclusion about whether or not the invention is obvious. Now, I will warn everyone on the phone, this goes both ways. If your inventors solve the problem in 27 minutes and, and then go for a long lunch, um, that's not good. That Even though the law has eliminated the eureka moment, the law has eliminated the, the method of invention from the analysis, legally speaking, judges are normal, regular people. And if your inventor takes the stand and your inventor says, yeah, I, it's, I, I, had the, I, I was presented the problem after breakfast and I had it solved by lunch, that's, uh, that's not good in the, big, in the big scheme of things. That's going to, that's going to make, it, make it difficult. And I, you know, I can tell you in a moment of honesty, um, the only Hatch Waxman trial that that I've been involved with where we lost, we lost because uh, the 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 inventor solved the problem in 47 minutes. That was the I think the driving reason behind why we we lost that case. Um, okay, so let me turn it over back to you, Jeff. Uh, to, for the next slide to sort of walk through how to develop the, the invention story. Thanks, Chad. So 
Chad did, a, I think, a nice job explaining why the invention story um, is so important in a Hatch-Waxman trial. Um, so, so the question becomes, what, what can you do during drug development to um, enable yourself to pre pre present the best possible um, invention story when you get to trial? So the first thing is find out early what the invention story is. Uh, don't wait until uh, you know you, you're getting andas, you're you're ready to file your lawsuit. Find out early in the process, early in the drug development process, what the inventors say they invented um, and why they think uh, it's important and, and and better than what was um, out there before. So some some things to think about in um, trying to develop that story. What was the problem that the inventors faced? Um, and perhaps more importantly, how did the inventors view the problem um, perhaps differently than others in the industry did? There's lots of instances where there's a known problem in the industry, but the inventors came at it with a, a different approach um, and with a, a different mindset, and that really helped them get to a result that that others um, did not and, and would not have. Find out what eureka moments they had. Um, as Chad said, it, there's no legal requirement for a eureka moment, but you, you'd be amazed how important simple statements um, you know, from documents like, wow, it worked, um, or you won't believe this how important those types of statements can be when you're presenting the invention story um, at trial to, to the judge. Um, really importantly, what failures and hurdles did they encounter along the way? Uh, this is something that uh, a lot of people um, uh, just frankly don't do very well. They record and, and find out kind of what the, um, the positives were, what the, you know, the benefits were that were uncovered, how they got to the successful product, but they leave out um, all the the failure, um, all the failed experiments, um, you know, all of the the paths followed that led to a dead end along the way. Those those types of failures are um, of just extreme importance when you're defending. Your patents against obviousness arguments um, later in the case. And, and then last, you know, find out what, what's the benefit of this invention compared to previous treatments. Um, and what is it particularly from the inventor's perspective? Um, and when I say early, when you want to find out this invention story early, you know, do it um, in the context of, of patent prosecution when these inventions are, are made. Uh, when invention disclosure forms are being filled out. Another good opportunity is, you know, before the, the NDA is being filed, um, when most of the inventive work that, that led to a product is likely done. Of course, there, there's always exceptions, but by the time you're filing an NDA, you, you probably have most of the inventive work done. Bring in counsel, talk to your inventors, find out the story, um, and and um, you know take the action needed as a result. Uh, so, what can you do with that story when you figure it out early? the The first thing is tell that story in the specification. Um, as Chad mentioned, the one document that I think everybody agrees and knows is going to be part of a Hatch Waxman trial is the patent or patents. Uh, and if the, the patent specification highlights the problems, the hurdles, the benefits of the invention in a way that's consistent with the inventor's story, it can really help corroborate and support the inventor's testimony at trial. Um, it shows that this isn't just something that, um, that, that lawyers came up with um, right before a, a lawsuit started but is the way that the inventor has viewed this from, from day one. Um, 
And then also make sure that the patent claims are consistent with the invention story. So what do I mean by that? Um, make sure that the claims focus on the key features um, of the invention. That, that may not be very complicated if we're just talking about claims to uh, an active ingredient, um, but for formulation claims, for uh, process claims, make sure that, that the claims focus on the inventor's secret sauce. Uh, and then last, make sure the claims are commensurate in scope with what the inventors invented. That may seem obvious, but uh, sometimes the tendency of, of patent prosecutors is to try to go as broad as possible, and that has definite benefits in some cases. But talk to the inventors, make sure that when presented with uh, a, a genus claim, they can rationally explain why that claim scope is um, sort of within the bounds of what they actually invented. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say on developing the story is, uh, is maybe the, the most obvious, but we don't have it here on the slide. Figure out who's going to actually tell this story at trial. Um, often there are multiple inventors included on patents, um, and, and usually um, one or two are sort of the folks that were leading the effort or have the best information. Um, you also want to make sure that whoever is going to tell your story at trial is able to do that in an articulate um, and, and convincing manner. Uh, once you identify that person, keep them happy. <laughs> don't, don't, you know, with, within reason, try not to, to obviously to alienate them. You want them to be around and be happy when you get to your trial. And if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, Chad talked about this a little bit already, but documents um, can be really important to um, corroborating and supporting the invention story at trial. This is gonna be years and years after the inventors off, uh, did the work and um, memories can fade and documents are a really good way to, um, to, to corroborate the inventor's testimony, make sure it doesn't seem contrived, um, and, and just support it generally. So Chad mentioned lab notebooks. Those are typically um, among the most important documents to um, support an invention story. Um, a couple tips on those. So, we touched on this already, but make sure the lab notebooks record failures as well as successes. We don't just want to see the successes. We want to see the road, sometimes bumpy, um, that it took to get to um, the ultimate product and invention. Uh, make sure that the lab notebooks are countersigned for corroboration. Um, that corroboration should be ideally um, independent from somebody not uh, involved in the, the inventive work. Um, it should be done, you know, in a timely fashion after the, the notebook entry uh, is made. And then last, encourage your scientists to not include privileged information in their lab notebooks. Uh, you'd be amazed how often we, we see this when we get the documents um, we look in lab notebooks and we see, um, you know, discussions of important prior art, uh, claiming strategies, um, you know, uh, meetings with prosecution counsel, things like that that should not be in there. Um, those things can can likely be redacted, um, but it can be very difficult to catch that type of information in um, large stacks of handwritten notebooks. Uh, other important documents, we, we talked a little bit about project reports, weekly team meetings, um, gating documents like go, no-go decisions. Um, those can often give you kind of the bigger picture of the, the team's work than a laboratory notebook. Um, and as Chad said, can sort of do so often in, in much simpler and easier to understand language than the lab notebooks themselves. 
Uh, so last on this, this may seem um, self-evident, but make sure that you have systems in place to preserve these documents, to find them in the first place, identify them, preserve them, and make sure they're easy to find later. Uh, we, we actually had a case uh, years ago where uh, our, our client had bought another company um, where the, the actual work to develop the, the drug, uh, most of it, had been done, um, and the work that led to, to some of the patents in the case um, had been done. And um, we were probably a year, year and a half into the case, and, and nobody had been able to find uh, much in the way of invention records, lab notebooks, meeting minutes, the things that we've been talking about. A year and a half into the case, the, the client discovered um, that there was a, uh, a filing cabinet in this abandoned building that had kind of come along with the other company that had reams of information about the invention that was, was incredibly helpful um, to, to the case. Um, not something that, that you know, uh, the, our client want, had any reason to, to hide, right? They actually wanted to use this stuff, but they didn't know where it was and it had kind of just been buried. So make sure that this stuff is identified, preserved, and um, easy to find. Uh, Chad, I think I'll flip it over to you for the next slide. Sure, thanks, Jeff. So basically this slide, and I'm just gonna sort of talk over it rather than go through the bullet points one by one, but, but basically this slide stands for two propositions. The one is team coordination. Um, to the extent that you have a say in the matter, you should have an IP person assigned to the R&D team and they should develop good relationships. Um, it's in everyone's interest. And when I say R&D team, I'm including clinical, commercial, regulatory, everybody basically. You want all the stakeholders at one table because in the end of the day, if you're relying on the scientists to tell you what their inventions are simply through submitting an ROI, sorry, a record of invention, you're probably missing out on a lot of patentable stuff. Because one thing that I have seen happen time in and time again, and I think it's a universal truth, really, really, really smart people, the kind of people that develop these products, they take for granted how smart they are. And they, they tend to diminish their own accomplishments. And so you might say to them, that sounds like a patent to me. And they'll say, oh, it was easy. No, that doesn't, that's not patent worthy. Of course, they're not a patent lawyer or a patent agent. They don't know. So, so long story made short, um, you should have someone who does know what is patentable and what isn't sort of embedded in those. The other part of this document, the second part of this slide that I just want to talk about at a high level briefly in the interest of time is don't hurt yourself with bad documents. Have an education process. We frequently go and give presentations to clients to to their in-house people about not creating bad documents and we'll come in with bad documents that have been created that cause problems for no reason um there are there are sort of two let me sit let me rephrase let me say this a different way the marketing department's going to kill you each and every time every bad document that i've ever had to deal with in the litigation nine times out of ten that bad document came out of the marketing department um, i don't know what it is about marketing people sometimes they just talk and they just say things and and frequently it it isn't it just doesn't pan out um, so so the marketing department is probably where you want to spend some time educating them on on some of these bad things the other part is this idea of talking in emails, especially about this idea of evergreening or line extensions. So what we're talking about here is you have a product, you you then sort of ex come out with a second product to replace that first product and talk about it in a way, you know, you're extending your line. And there's a lot of, there were a lot of bad things done 15, 20 years ago where where companies would try to sort of extend their product by maybe just giving it a new name or tweaking one little thing that didn't really matter. Um, and, and, and that's not really what I'm talking about here, but, but 
but people tried that as a as a way to try to enhance exclusivity or extend exclusivity and it didn't work so people don't do it anymore but the but this idea of line extensions got a bad rap because of that we deal with line extension patents all the time um and and what i've noticed to be universally true is that they're really good patents they're really good inventions um usually because the your your customers are highly sophisticated doctors who are ethically bound to do what's best for their patients and aren't going to switch them from the previous product maybe even the previous product that's now generic that they can get inexpensively unless whatever is next is a true improvement over what happened what came before so there's usually a really great story to be had some problem that was solved some side effect that was cured some some efficacy impact that was enhanced um, with these extensions or with with the follow-on product um, the the key is to not to not shoot yourself in the foot by saying you know for business reasons or whatever it might be that that maybe those things aren't as as valid as they might other be otherwise be so uh so okay let me get off my soapbox now and jeff um let me turn it back to you to to sort of talk about talk about infringement thanks chad so we, we've talked a little bit about the types of patents and the themes you typically see in a hatch waxman trial so we're going to spend a little time talking about um, the claims and defenses that you typically see and what you can do to prepare for those so in a hatch waxman trial you're, you're going to be asserting either direct or indirect infringement um, just for for background direct infringement um, is when the, the defendant themselves makes, use, uses, sells, or offers to sell the invention. Um, indirect infringement occurs when the, the defendant does not itself infringe, but causes another party to do so. So in, I'd say in the majority of Hatch-Waxman cases, you're going to see uh, some combination of, of all three of these, these types of infringement. Uh, next slide, please. And we've we've tried to show on this slide the um, type of infringement that is typically associated with the different types of a pa a patents um, you are able to to get uh, relevant to a drug product. So for compound and formulation patents, uh, we're often talking about direct infringement. For method of treatment patents, because the the defendant is uh, not likely to be um, administering the drug or taking the drug, um, it, it's usually indirect infringement. And for manufacturing and process patents, um, depending on how the claim is written um, and who who's actually making the drug, you can potentially have have both. Now you're not going to know for sure um, what types uh, of causes of action you have it, until you actually start getting paragraph four letters um, and perhaps even get some discovery um, from the defendants. And that's the, the period of time we've, we've tried to highlight there um, in yellow. So there are things you can be doing in advance besides, um, as we've already talked about, just trying to get a full patent portfolio there are things you can do to prepare to prove these different types of infringement. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So let, let's talk first about direct infringement. Um, and what, what you can do here is think in advance about how you're going to prove the defendant's product meets each of your claim limitations. What information are you going to point to, um, to to show that? And and so a good way to think about this is well, what what information is going to be in the defendant's possession um, that they'll have to give you in discovery? Um, they're they're going to have to produce their ANDA, um, their their DMF or drug master file, which um, typically has the details of how the the drug is manufactured. Um, product samples and things like development documents, their own internal development documents 
that led to the, the uh, proposed generic product. So you can think through all those categories of documents and, and what you'll use to prove each claim limitation. Um, it, just as a side note, you know, we, we've seen in recent years uh, a lot of generics taking the position that the only thing relevant to proving infringement is the ANDA itself, and so you shouldn't get discovery into some of these other things like product samples and, and DMFs. And courts have pretty much universally said that that's, uh, that's not right. You, you, as a plaintiff, are entitled to more information, and that information is relevant or can be relevant to proving infringement. So specific things to look at, we've outlined some of them here, and I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly in the interest of time, um, but figure out what the generic is likely to have to submit with um, their ANDA. Uh, we know, you know that the, their label, with some exceptions, will have to be very similar to the, uh, the NDA label. Um, you can often find FDA guidance documents, um, for certain types of products where FDA requires something more than just um, basic bioequivalence testing. Um, usually that's, that's for, for safety reasons. Um, but, but figure out what, what they're going to have to give FDA. Um, examples, what kind of pharmacokinetic data might they have to submit? Do they have to submit CMAX data or area under the curve data or both or something else? Um, do they have to submit things like XRPD measurements for, for salt and polymorph um, forms, stability data? And what you can take from that is if you have claims that are focused on the types of things that you know you'll be able to get information on um, easily, it may make proving infringement at trial um, a lot easier um, at the end of the day. Okay, next slide, please. And Chad, I think I'm going to flip it over to you to talk about uh, indirect infringement. Sure. Um, thanks. And before I get to to um, the specific content of this slide, let me. Let, we we have some questions, and I apologize we haven't been able to get to many of them um, with the time that we have. But 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 one 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 of the audience members asked. When it comes to the development of patent portfolios, is it effective to seek patents covering risk evaluation and mitigation strategies? The acronym for that is, is REMS, R-E-M-S, or other tox mitigation strategies or, or approaches or ways? Um, the answer is yes. Um, and here's the reason. It's really difficult to tell down the road where you're going to be. If, we, if you consider the timeline that we've been looking at, you're talking about trying to, you know, patent, patent prosecutors have a rough, a rough life. They're asked to write patents that are going to stand the test of time, that by the time they're actually litigated, the law will have changed 47 times. Um, and you have no idea of knowing what, what the future will hold. Um, so, so generally speaking, the answer to the question is, Yes, if you feel like you can get a patent on those things, then you should try. We've 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 litigated cases, tried cases where where literally the only patents that we had left by the time we were going to trial were were patents on eliminating side effects, and those can be those can be um, really valuable. We had one patent back; it was the very first Hatch Waxman trial that this firm ever did. Um, 20 years ago, 17 years ago, something like that, where, where the invention was a reduction in the side effect, the allergic side effect that a drug caused um, by 15%. And, and we were successful in that. So, so, so the answer is an unqualified yes. So now back to the, back to the proving indirect infringement. Um, here's the important thing, and this is a thing that, um, that the law of indirect infringement, the law of inducement in particular, is not so easy to understand. Um, most most U.S. lawyers, most just lawyers, period, don't really fully understand inducement and don't fully understand how hard it is to prove at, at trial. And the reason it's so hard to prove is that there is a requirement that you show 
that the if we're talking about a hatch waxman case that the generic drug company specifically intended to induce the infringement so specific intent is not a phrase that that we come across very often in patent law but and here is the rub here is the problem specific intent is a is a standard that you come across all the time in criminal law and your judge whoever that is 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 going to be deeply steeped in criminal law knowledge whether regardless of what jurisdiction you're in you're talking about a federal judge a lot of whom were u.s attorneys or assistant u.s attorneys and have a huge criminal docket pending in front of them so they're going to be intimately familiar with the level of proof required to meet the specific intent standard and and if you think about what it is you have to meet that standard you have to prove not only that the generic drug company knew of your patent that's easy because they send you a paragraph four letter but you also have to prove that they are specifically intending that the acts being carried out by the other by the third person and this it is usually the doctor or the patient or a combination of the doctor and the patient um, that that those people are doing things in a specific way and that has to be done through the label there's no other way to do it and you'll see there's a gamut of federal circuit cases dealing with whether or not the label satisfies this level of 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 intent um, i actually did a webinar you can find it on the firm's website where we spend a ton of time talking about indirect infringement so just really focus on what your label says focus on the indication focus on what the drug is indicated for focus on the usage section um, read, um, read Judge Andrew Sanofi decision from Delaware, read Judge Bryson's Bayer decision from the Federal Circuit. Those will sort of give you the bookends of, uh, and sort of opposite ends of the spectrum of what it takes to prove, prove inducement. We only have two minutes left, Jeff. Um, um, in the, in the, in the sort of two minutes that are, that are left, um, perhaps let's just jump again to, let's just jump to slide maybe 24. And Jeff, maybe you can just sort of wrap up everything we've been talking about with this slide and, um, and then we will, we'll just say thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Chad. So, um, we, we talked a little bit about infringement. Uh, there are also things you can do to prepare for the defenses that, uh, you can reasonably expect uh, at trial. And we don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to walk through all of these. But again, a, a good time to consider all this is around the time that your NDA is filed. Um, you know, commit the resources, bring an outside counsel if needed, and think about these things while you, um, you still have continuations likely pending. Um, you know, the label is not quite finalized. Um, and uh, the, the regulatory documents have not all been submitted. Think through these issues, think of what you can do to prepare for, um, for defenses. Uh, okay, so I think we are out of time. Um, we've gone a full hour now, and we, we both really appreciate you giving us that uh, big of a chunk of your day. Um, hopefully we've been able to give you some helpful information. I know there's a few questions we didn't get to. Um, we'll follow up with those uh, folks. Uh, and again, please don't um, hesitate to contact us with additional questions. Thanks for joining, and hopefully you'll be able to join us um, for the, the next installment. Have a good day.